And people yeah. people look at us like we're nuts, and they're like, the thing is, I love it. Yeah. I love it. They're like, well, don't you just want to go home sometime and watch television? You're like, no, I want to make television. On this episode of Sea level I sit down with my good friend Chris Ledoux, founder and VFX supervisor of Crafty Apes, the VFX company behind Stranger Things, Jumanji, Doctor Strange, and many more. <laughs> For the very small percentage of people that don't know who Crafty Apes is and who you are, give me a little bit of background. Like, how did you get started? Where are you from? What's Crafty Apes about? Uh, originally, I'm from uh, an island in Alaska called Kodiak Island. That's where I originally hail from, and my family hails from because it's a family business. Right. And I moved to Los Angeles, I moved to San Francisco in 2004, and did my first visual effects job there for a movie called uh, Sin City. Mm-hmm. And I composed yep, it. Yeah, very that. familiar. Yep. And uh, it was it was fun. It was I loved it. Fell in love with the, the business. And uh, 2005, I moved to Los Angeles. So in 2005, moved to Los Angeles. Spent about a year in. A random city called Santa Maria, yeah. where we made uh, Pan's Labyrinth mm-hmm. and uh, did some other movies. Okay. And then went back to LA, and then in 2007, we uh, started the company. Or sorry, 2011, we started the company. We okay. started in Culver City. Actually, technically for three months, we started in Venice mm-hmm. at this 200-square-foot trailer park we work. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was very humble beginnings. A lot of people have those humble beginnings. It was a 200, yeah, it yeah. was just me, yeah. Tim, and Jason, and Mark in an office. And yeah. A couple months later, we went to Culver City. Right. And while we were there, our one of our first clients was Lionsgate mm-hmm. and Tyler Perry specifically. Right. So that started drawing me to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I started filming here in 2012, 2013. And while I was here, I started learning about the actual tax credit mm-hmm. and how it worked. And I started, you could almost smell the buzz in the air, the right. feel it. There was like, man, there's something happening here. Right. And I looked around, there wasn't any other really VFX companies of, you know, a certain, you know, caliber, you right. know, and I went back to California and I told everyone, I said, hey, I think uh, we should expand to Atlanta. I think, you know, let's, let's go for it. Right. And it took, uh, it took some convincing. There was some back and forth. Right, um, right. But uh, my brother Tim was strongly on board with it. And he's the one who actually did the first operation out here. So we got a call in March of 2014 for a pilot. Okay. And it was a uh, colleague of ours who was doing a TV show and said, hey, I heard you guys are in Atlanta. We're like, Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and we uh, filed the paperwork. We, Tim and uh, our other colleague Josh jumped in a truck and drove across the country with a bunch of computers. Wow. And we started downtown. And yeah. I'm not even, it was close to uh, underground right. and uh, close to gunshots. And they did the pilot. Gosh. And then I was already doing a TV show that was based out of here, but we weren't here officially yet. So right. that, I started filming in May. And then I was like, okay, we gotta be. I just I called my wife, and yeah. she had just given birth to our child. And oh, you know, I was like, yeah. by the way, we're uh, moving to Atlanta. And just, <laughs> and here it is. Yeah, just, just so you know, let's we're just get all the change out of the way it was. <laughs> right, right. And she had been in. Right. Uh, she had born and raised in LA for thirty nine years. Never oh, wow. lived anywhere else. And oh, wow. so, so what was she thinking that Atlanta was like? She had been here before, yeah. and she she's in production also, so she loved it. Yeah, she's uh, she's she actually prefers it now. Yeah, and. Uh, so it's, it's been great. I mean, there is that, there, I can't, it must have been like the gold rush in Alaska in 1910 or, you know, 1849 gold rush. It's, there's a certain buzz in the air here. There's right. a certain ambition. There's a certain person that it attracts. There's a certain twinkle in their eye. Right. And so the kind of people you're around, like I love being in LA because there's more creative people in LA than anywhere in the universe, right. you know, just shoved into one spot. And right. I, I loved it for that reason. And in Atlanta, that you have all these ambitious people mm-hmm. in a variety of industries. Right. And with film in general, you know, because we have interests, you know, we're interested in all of filmmaking. You know, we do visual effects, but, you know, we we'll go shoot our own stuff, right? And uh-huh. so the people you meet here are people that are hungry and they're ambitious. And that sort of attitude is what I really like. They don't mm-hmm. complain. Right. They're not, they don't treat like, I mean, every day working in film is kind of a blessing. You know, it's, it's not quite being quarterback for the Seahawks, but it was the next best thing. So <laughs> right. The, uh, when you're on, you know, it's, it's really never a bad day when you stop and think about it for a second. Right. And so... You get paid to play. That's well, yeah, <laughs> no. And, you know, in a lot of areas, you go on yeah. set and people act like, you know, they're basically like, you know, coal miners getting shot. Right, you know, like, right, you know, right. It's just so right. terrible. Like, man, we're making movies. Right. For, for, we're getting paid, paid for to it. do this. <laughs> paid pretty well. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, uh, I couldn't be happier, really. And I mean that in all sincerity. It's not a... Uh, I really am happy out here. It's cool. And, I, and honestly, it's... I've never been to a place where you couldn't find a good time. I mean, good bars here. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And, and, and that's what I, and I love about Atlanta, too, is it's, 
it's got everything, you know, like you're like four hours to the beach, you know, you can yeah. go to Northwest Florida, right? You can go over to Savannah, you got the mountains. I mean, it's the, the landscape's great. Um, you've got the city, right? So there's the, the ITP, OTP, right? So for people who don't know, inside the perimeter, outside the perimeter, I just moved outside right? the perimeter. Did you? Yeah. I see, like for me, like I, I love working in the city, but like our office is right, right outside the perimeter which is kind of convenient for everybody, but I love living like out into the country, like a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, I just moved, moved to the country. Yeah, 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 a little bit more space, you know, but um, I love the hustle and bustle. And, and to mention, to piggyback on what you were saying before about the entertainment business, what I love is that, like you said, there's a lot of hustlers out here. There's a lot of people that are willing to make something happen. And the entertainment business, what I'm finding in Atlanta is it can be whatever it wants to be. Yeah. You know, like, it's not like, you know, New York and L.A. has their pretty much their set ways, whereas Atlanta, it's like this thing that's constantly evolving and growing. No, there's this chance to invent and be whatever we want to be. And right. it's, uh, the longer things progress in any industry or anyone's life, the more you get set in pe those ways, the right. more the script gets hardened. It's like, you know, I came from a small town. Right. You hit a certain yeah. age and you are who you are. Right. And that's who you'll always be. Right. And... You know, when, you, when I moved away to college, you know, and away from there, you know, you realize, you know, when I went to college at like 18, you can invent yourself. Right. You can be whoever you want. Yeah. And that's what, as an, on a larger macro level, we can do whatever we want here right now. We have an opportunity. Right. You know, right now we are the, we're the middle of the ecosystem. We're the production. We're not the funding. We're not the distribution. Right. But that's coming. And we have a chance right now to be whatever we want, to create whatever we want. Right. You know, and you hear a lot of people, you know, when you talk to people in film and you know, when you talk to a lot of, you know, budding filmmakers, and they're like, well, how does this work? And then, you know, inevitably that, that guy goes, well, let me tell you. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. well, it doesn't have to be no. that way. You know, and if Innovate. you look at anything, yeah. you know, it's like, I'm a big football guy. It's like when Bill Walsh coughed up the West Coast offense, everyone's like, you have to run the ball to win the game. It's right. like, no, no you don't. Like, right, you know, right. so that's really exciting because we can decide, it's even visual effects, which is the youngest part of the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, we're only 20, 30 years old, really. Right. And we come up with new ways to do things all the time. Right. You know, like, oh, let's try this technique or this piece of software. Let's tie it into the pipeline. Like, go hire that Bulgarian coder. Right, you know, right, it's like, right. And that's what I truly love about visual effects is every day is different for me. Yeah. Every day is different problems to solve. And they're hectic and crazy. Right. But that's, that's, that feeling you get when you've actually conquered a large battle is, is fantastic. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that's what I love about it. It's the problem solving. It's yeah. tremendous. <laughs> So what is the process of, of VFX? Like, what do you have like a specific way? Like, you get a script, you storyboard yeah, I mean, it out? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways we do work on a larger movie. Like, we just did a, a lot of shots on Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. On a movie like that, every shot's a visual effect. Right. So you're saying, in that kind of movie, maybe there's 2,500 cuts. Right. You know, because we look at our widget is a shot from cut to cut. Right. You know, and so they'll send the shots to bid. They've already shot at that point, mm -hmm. you know, or they, if they're about to shoot. So that's one way we do work. Uh, a lot of ways we do work, especially out here, is... It's soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. Someone hands us a script, we break it down, we say, here's what we think the visual effects are. Right. And then all that's kind of BS because then they shoot what they shoot and they edit what they right. edit. And it's more of a guide. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's hard for line producers with VFX because we're kind of like the Department of Defense black market budget. Yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah. We try to keep prices down, but right. because they've now deducted so many shooting days, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be people would have 90 days to shoot a movie. Right. And that still happens if your name is Scorsese. Right, you know, exactly. Now people get 30 days. days yep. Well, it's not like the tech of filmmaking has gotten that much better. So what happens is there's more mistakes because now they rely on us as an insurance policy. Right. Like, oh, we got rained out that day. Go green screen. Yeah. VFX will make it. Or, right. oh, right. there's three grips smoking cigarettes in the background. How right. do you get rid of that? Right. You know, it's right. like VFX. And right. so a lot of our work is uh, stuff that's completely unplanned. Yeah. You know, and we... So you get that call like, oh, uh, hey, we need to remove that bottle the uh you know pa left on set or something like well, that. what happens yeah, all the yeah, time yeah, people yeah. you know it's yeah. like hey you know this actor you know has a double chin and i'm like my god he's 70 years old of course he does <laughs> like, and they're like yeah, right, you know right, right, they're right. like yeah but right. people don't know that right and like right. the uh and so we're able to even in that realm for example we can extend if you think of an actor um as having like a, a shelf life mm -hmm. we're able to extend that now wow 
Um, you know, especially if you're like an action star or something right, like that. You right. know, there's we can change quite a bit, you know, environments, people. So given that, you know, it's it saves money in the long run. Because mm-hmm. if you think of how much a shooting day costs. Right. And we're able to save shooting days now. Like you know, there was one movie we did where they didn't get a line from an actress. And they're like, oh man, it's gonna cost us like so much money to go reshoot this. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I just noticed, I noticed my uh, producer here has the same uh, lips as the actress. I'm like, I want to do the Conan O'Brien no thing, shoot her saying the line, and yeah. then surgically, and we did it, and it's seamless, you oh, can't tell. Awesome. And um, so we're able to do, completely change the world in post, which it's honestly, it's good and it's, good and it's also hard, because yeah. if you, I think part of creativity is, Creativity loves a sandbox. Right, right. Like if someone says to me, if, hey, Chris, can you write a treatment? I'm like, okay, what's the topic? And they're like, anything you want. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if somebody says, here's the parameters, yeah. then my mind starts spinning because creativity now knows the rules it can push and break. Mm-hmm. So I think when you shoot a film in 1978, you got what you got. Right. And you're going to cut it, actually cut it, the film. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to figure out how to do it within that sandbox. Right. And I think it's hard now because creatively, if you shot a movie tomorrow, but then you, after you shot it, I said, well, we can actually do quite a bit. It sounds good, mm-hmm. but I think creatively, it's something, it sometimes becomes difficult for people because they're like, well, can I do this? Right. Can I do this? And they don't realize that, well, you said I could do this, so isn't this the same price? And you're like, no, the second one involves a dragon. Right. <laughs> right. And it's, so we do a lot of education. We have to educate our clients on actually what they're buying yeah. and what they're paying for. and. Every, our whole world is based on time. Right. They're like, well, why does that take yeah. 50 hours and that takes four hours? I'm like, well, because of blah, blah, blah. Right. And so there's a lot of misconceptions which we have to combat. You know, like, you know, people really do think we have dinosaur buttons. <laughs> you know, and there's like, you know, fancy like software yeah, right, that the right, Japanese right. probably wrote. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you just have like a Godzilla button you just right. hit and it just... Yeah, it appears. Yeah. yeah. Now like, we have to create that. <laughs> no, and that's yeah. the thing. At the end of the day, the software is amazing, mm-hmm. but the artists are what do everything. And the amount of attention to detail and knowledge about tech and art and, you know, the craft of, you know, even basic composition right. has to be pretty extensive. And so it's, that's what's fun about it is you're pulling from all these different avenues. Right. And, you know, so given that, it's, um, there's something we have, it's called Blinn's Law. And it has to do with uh, computing power because we're always, you know, we're getting faster computers and everyone's mm-hmm. like, oh man, when, this is amazing. Yeah. Like now we can do stuff faster. And right. it all, it, the, what the client asked for now just expands to fill that bubble right, and continuously right. expands right, to fill right, it. Right. And I saw, I was reading something on Reddit the other day where someone from DreamWorks was talking and they were, uh, they had to re-render Toy Story 1, the original. Gotcha. And they, they, cause they needed to do some tests right. to compare. Right. And they hit the button, they went to lunch and they came back and they came back and the render farm was off. I'm like, why's the render farm off? It should be gone. The render farm had already re- re-rendered the entire movie in a couple hours. Wow. And, but you think that's 20 years ago when right, the first one came right, out. And that's right, how, you know, so, right. but these guys are like, we're still working the same amount of hours. Yeah, like it doesn't yeah, change. Yeah, you know, so now yeah. the client wants this and wants it. So yeah. that's the nature of uh, what we're doing is it never, I don't think it'll change for, you know, as we get into VR, AR, artificial right, intelligence right. and machine learning. Yeah. I think 30 years from now. Yeah. VFX artists will still be saying the same thing. Yeah. They're like, oh, I did 14 hours yesterday. Like, what happened? Like, yeah. Well, you know, the director hated the whole movie, so we redid the whole thing. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. So, um, but that's what's fun about it. It's like I said, every day. Is I like to say, like, I know enough to be dangerous, but I hire the professionals that know it. And I've always been fascinated with technology and, and the, the, the changes that, that are happening. And I could say happen so fast. So in the VFX world, what are some of the things that we can do now that we weren't able to do in the past? And what, what are some of the things that are on the horizon that you see uh, that make your job easier? Um, I, sorry, there's so many. I mean, take from basic shot tracking, you know, we have to track cameras. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, that was insane. You right. Know, you know, right. Uh, Matchimation. You know, that's, that's still largely manual, but there's software to help out. The rigging of characters, the rendering of CG, right. the way we light CG, and the way we um, composite and integrate that CG into the real world. The tech, you know, because every day you stand on the shoulders of those that came before you. Right. 
And so that knowledge accumulates. So what's happened with us is we have way more shocks than ever. And it's the stuff you would never imagine. Yeah. It's, well, the director doesn't like where this book's sitting on the shelf. Like, all right. Move it. Like, you know, <laughs> right. And, uh, right. Or we don't like, you know, the big one is uh, splits. Like, oh, yeah. we like the actor in this take, but we like the actress in this take. Can you, can you, you know. So they're taking, right. they're really taking advantage of the technology. Oh, yeah. That, that are, as they get savvier, and you get some really savvy editors out there, mm-hmm. they can do a lot of grafting mm. and they can completely change what was shot or what it was intended for because they know what we're capable of. And a lot of times people come to us with ideas. Right. And they say, what can you do? And that's what happened on, say, Hidden Figures, for example. Because yeah. right. it didn't, it was not a high budget movie. And when they saw the first cut after we're done shooting, you know, they went, they were like, oh man, we got a great movie on our hands. Mm. How do we, how do we expand the production scope? Because they didn't have the money to go back and shoot. So the director came to me and said, what can you do? I started looking at our shots and I go, okay, well, you know, we shot this over at, you know, o- OFS. Mm-hmm. That's the scene actually took place in Florida. Right. Let's roto out this guy. I'll go down to Florida. I'll go to Canaveral. I'll and get a bunch of plates. Get it, yeah. And so I called up Canaveral, got a bunch of plates from him, you know, went there and shot, just grabbed my red camera. Right. And shot a bunch of plates and then completely changed locations on a ton of these things. Right. And all of a sudden, the scope of the movie felt way more expensive. It felt like a bigger project. Right. And a lot of that stuff, because we shot pretty much all Atlanta. Right. And, you know, these locations, a lot of them didn't look like the real. So we were trying to do that. And so by doing, and, you know, we created, you know, let's, let's put a CG rocket in here. Let's right. do this. Right. And right. so we're able to help the, the storytellers in that way because production scope and quality is a subconscious thing. Yep. It's easy to say, well, production quality. Well, what does that mean? You know, it's like, right. well, it means more aerial shots. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so... Um, a lot of, you know, you look at what a low-budget movie looks like versus a high-budget, that's one of the first things you see. Yep. And there's something in the audience when they feel a certain quality, mm-hmm. and it's very subconscious. It's, it's why, like, 24P looks so different to you than 60i. Right. And it, all of a sudden, you re- look at projects and receive them in a wholly different way. Right. What's some advice you can give, like, someone that wants to step into the VFX world and then your industry, like, what are some good advice you can give them? Well, the software, the tutorials mm-hmm. are all online. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. For a few hundred bucks, you could literally have every video, every piece of training you would need to become a good artist. Mm-hmm. What you'd be missing, and I'm not saying someone would have it, is you'd be missing a work ethic mm-hmm. and a client. And the important thing about having a client, and even if it's a free client, if your buddy's making a music video or whatever, it is a business. Right. And which means you, ha- you are making, you are trying to interpret someone else's vision. Now you can always make your own stuff and go your own route, and we all do it, and that's right. great. But if you're trying to make money off it, it means at some point you are going to have a client, and you are going to come down to that thing, which ties in what we are already talking about, human communication. You're like, I want an elephant. Well, what kind of elephant? A cool one. What does that mean, cool? Like, you right, know, right. you're cool or my cool? Right, like, right, right. I don't like mid-century modern. Right. I think it's tacky. Like, <laughs> so, Given it, it is tech, yeah. Um, the um, so given that I have to interpret what you're saying, I have to do, which is the fun part is I have to do my best to look at the world through Chris De Blasio's point of view. So like, hmm, has he ever seen an elephant? Like, is he basing this off of Dumbo or Willy Wonka? Like, what right, is he? Right. And so they have to learn to extract that information. You have from to their learn client. to deal with clients, yeah. and you have to learn that you're going to do something. You have to build a thick skin. You are going to create something that you think is the greatest thing ever. And a client's going to tell you, you're an idiot. And your IQ can be 50 points higher than the client. It right. doesn't matter. Right. They're signing the check. They're still and so the right. that's the hard part about it. It's, and remember, I tell people this is not art. It's a craft. And arts and crafts are different. Art is, you know, your retired mother painting a rose. Right. George Bush painting a right. squirrel. Right. That's art. Right. Craft is the guy, the architect. The person who combines art and tech. And you have to understand both, and you have to develop that thick skin. And all these shots in this reel and stuff, these all went through multiple, multiple iterations. Like the only time you get version one finals are when you're on a low budget TV show. And there's no time. Right. But when you're on a movie, I was on one movie, our average final was version 136 for the average final. Wow. Over and over. And they, they go this way, and they tell like, no, make it this way, make it this so way. So patient, patience would also you be. You have another. to develop patience. <laughs> yeah. It's a. Uh, you have to just know what your life is. You know, it helps to, I got lucky, my wife's in production. And so she understands what this is. Yeah. 
Uh, if your significant other is not in production, mm-hmm. probably looking at divorce. Yes, it's like, tough. and it's challenging. they just don't yep. understand. They're like, yep. well, "Don't you just get off at right. five? And you're right. like, "I'm not a high school principal." Right, right. Like, you know. Right. And I lucked out. My wife's in, in medical, so she's used they, to the schedules. Yeah. So I think that's the one exception. <laughs> so like, well, she works we live crazy a different hours life. Too. Yeah. And people, yeah. people look at us like we're nuts, and yeah. they're like, "The thing is, I love it. Yeah. I love it." They're like, "Well." Don't you just want to go home sometime and watch television? Like, no, I want to make television. Make, yeah. Like, I don't want to sit in my couch and watch the news. Like, yeah. you go get brainwashed. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it's like I'll it's do funny. The and I think as filmmakers, like we we look at we look at work differently. It's sometimes that suspension of disbelief is just not there because we're looking at and you're probably looking at oh man that that VFX could have done this or I see the pixelation there or whatever it is you know so sometimes it's, you know we look at it differently. It's hard. Yeah, well, I'll never enjoy things the same way. You know, it's the same way like. An average person might they right. might watch a movie and just be wowed by it. Yeah. And yeah, I'm I'm watching it. And I'm probably I'm breaking it down. Right. You know, but I you know, I can still I enjoy stories so much that I can just turn my like I was watching Chernobyl and yeah, I noticed a couple times where I'm like I mean the, and the work was great there were no flaws I'm like oh, I wonder how long that simulation took yeah that, that's right. a lot of smoke right, right there right, like, right, right. Oh, there's a lot of road over right, there. Like, right, so, right yeah um but it doesn't make it I still enjoy them I just don't have any time to watch yeah. so but you yeah. know so I'm constantly you know. Netflix is my friend. I'm watching Star Trek Voyager over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, man, this has been great. Uh, Thanks for giving me the tour. And, dude, keep up the great work. Thank you. Appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you find the C-Level Facebook group, sign up to the group, and make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you get the latest episode. Until next time.